And with Palestinians, we've covered a great deal about Ajaj, and there's still more to find out. But as even PBS Frontline themselves highlighted, that without Ajaj and the items that he carried when arriving at JFK Airport with Ramzi Youssef in 1992, there would be no premise to label such a loose network as Al-Qaeda. As demonstrated on their special about the late head of the FBI Terrorism Task Force, John O'Neill. But why in the late 80s after Ajaj's release from an Israeli prison and turned into Mossad asset was he assigned to Al Fatah, a group known to receive weapons, explosives, and training from the Soviet Union, but then somehow unnoticeably he was able to join Hamas, who was fighting with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan against the Soviets. And like Iyad Ishmoel living in Dallas, who suddenly appears after the 93 bombing conspiracy, Ajaj had also previously lived in Texas working as a pizza deliverer in San Antonio before entering the U.S. again in 1992. Essentially, Ajaj could be considered the bombing mastermind of 1993, being that he was also in a prime position while detained to make orders, since Yusuf wasn't able to entirely set up the bomb without Ajaj's manuals and experience. And from the bombing attempts that we have charted from Yusuf, most of them were unsuccessful. Ajaj has since been transferred from Supermax to Terra Hot Prison in Indiana 2018, and he, like many of these conspirators, are serving life sentences and are unapproachable for questions and interviews, which again, tells you many answers could be found on US shores rather than further obstructions through Gitmo, Cuba. But lastly and luckily, that's not the situation when it comes to the Pakistani Wali Khan Amin Shah as far as getting some sort of answers, as he's also in Terre Haute and was right in the middle of the Bojinka planning, for which also Ramzi Yusuf continued organizing under the Liberation Army 5th Battalion title, according to what was contained within a laptop and plot. Since Wali Khan Shah has been cooperative with US authorities, he was set to be free already in March of 2022, but there has been no media coverage about it. Perhaps we may get answers to who else was behind these 90s terrorist attacks and 9-11, and how they really functioned, but if these so-called top Al-Qaeda masterminds and leaders aren't born and raised fundamentalist Muslims, just like the case with Osama bin Laden, ironically, who in his early college years liked to live it up as a partying bachelor, shouldn't this all in the long run be called Arab terrorism? And coming back to 1993 with Ramsey and Mohammed Salame, who get in the car wreck on January 24, 1993, although no clear explanation as to why Salome was driving so nervously, resulting in the collision, neither is any explanation given as to what Yusuf and Salome were actually out doing, because it just so happens to be that the following day was the CIA headquarters shooting. It was the height of the morning rush hour. The traffic light at the entrance to the CIA on Route 123 had turned red. Cars came to a stop. From the center lane, a man emerged from his car carrying a high-powered rifle. He calmly walked between the two left lanes where motorists were waiting for the left turn signal into the CIA compound. Starting with the lead car, he opened fire at point-blank range. Then he turned, firing at the car on his other side and on down the line of standing vehicles. In the far left lane, the badly wounded driver of one car managed to turn into the visitor center at the CIA main gate where he alerted guards. A female passenger in this Volkswagen jumped from her car and ran to the CIA, also alerting guards. Dr. Barrett Burka and his wife were passing by when they heard the shots. My wife suddenly screamed, there's a man shooting. And I looked to my immediate left, and about 10, 15 feet away, uh, there was a, a fellow with a, what appeared to be a high-powered uh, hunting rifle uh, shooting into the automobiles. The gunman's final toll, two men killed, three others wounded. The CIA identified the dead as 28-year-old Frank Darling of Reston, Virginia, and 66-year-old Lansing Bennett, also of Reston. Both were employed by the CIA. Two of the wounded were also on the CIA staff, and a third worked for a CIA contractor. In the shock and confusion of the moment, police believe the gunman walked back into his light brown compact station wagon and drove off, eluding police despite extensive searches by air and ground. A Pakistani national, Mir Amil Kanzi, killed the two CIA employees in their cars as they were waiting at a stoplight and wounded three others outside of the George Bush Center for Intelligence, CIA headquarters campus, Langley, Virginia. Kanzi fled the country and was placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list, sparking an international manhunt. He was captured by Joint FBI-CIA Inter-Services Intelligence Task Force in Pakistan in 1997 and arraigned to the United States to stand trial. He admitted shooting the victims, was found guilty of capital and first-degree murder, 
and was executed by lethal injection in 2002. Ironically, as what's pointed out in History Channel's Road to 9-11 documentary, the intelligence task force in Pakistan were more concerted in their efforts to capture Kanzi for the CIA headquarters shooting rather than trailing Ramzi Yusuf for the Trade Center bombing, as the task force were only motivated by being tipped off by Yusuf's whereabouts through his confidant Ishtak Parker, wanting the $2 million FBI reward, while simultaneously as the task force were on the manhunt about to almost capture Kanzi, which would have rendered them to have been able to capture him sooner in 1995 rather than two years later in 1997. And coming back to Uncle Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, isn't it also interesting, as reported by Terry McDermott on June 24, 2002 in the LA Times, while KSM was still wanted, the members of his cell, including a girlfriend, had a drinking party to celebrate the anniversary of the 1988 Pan Am Flight 103 explosion over Lockerbie, Scotland, an incident officially blamed on Qaddafi and Libyan pilots and not anything remotely to do with Al-Qaeda. 